The world around us is full of content, and when we look at it, our brains are able to process it into meaningful things. We're able to make sense of a pot when we see it. Our brain gives it the meaning pot. When we look at a document and read a couple of words, we're able to read the heading and make sense of it and give it the meaning that's the heading. Unfortunately, computers don't have this innate ability that we have. So we have to use a special language that we call HTML to give meaning to the content that browsers and computers work with. So when a computer looks at a web page and loads it, it needs to know that the header is a header. It needs to know that a link is a link so that when you click on it, it can take you where the link should go. So we use a special language to give this meaning to the content of a web page. And the way we do it is very similar to how you might help somebody who didn't know English who was living in your house to understand the world around them. So if you had a foreign exchange student who didn't speak English, what you might do is get these little tags and go around your house and mark all the different parts of your living room and your kitchen and label everything with the English word so that your foreign exchange student can know when you ask for a kettle, oh, I remember it's the one that had that, that tag on it that said kettle. Similar to an HTML, we're gonna write on this sticky note the name of what it is that we're tagging so that when we put it on the kettle, now anyone who can read this tag will know that this is a kettle. HTML is similar in that the browser can understand anything that we put a tag on because it can read that little tag. So we have to go ahead and label every single thing in the kitchen. The cabinet and everything in it, each individual shelf, all of the stuff that's on our countertop, and then every single pot one at a time. So far we've been drawing a picture of the internet that includes a client and a server and a language but we haven't really talked much about what it is that's actually being transferred back and forth. Right now, what you've created is pure content, or it's just a plain text file, right? So you've uploaded this plain text file without any code, but you've just got this plain text file and it just has words. And if you go to the URL of your domain, it'll download it and show it to you in a browser. And we've seen it. So this is just content. This is what we're after when we're using the internet we usually don't care much about all the superfluous extra stuff. We don't really care what font is being used. We don't care what the code looks like. We don't care if it like looks really pretty. Content is the core. Anything else is an uh, additional layer that adds to the experience but isn't necessarily essential to using the web. Your pages are actually good enough to communicate content to people right now even though they're just plain text but if we wanted to add another layer we could use HTML code to give it some meaning so HTML will give some structure and meaning to the content it deals with the nouns of your web page it just defines what the different things are what noun they are it says this is a link this is a header it doesn't try to do anything more than just have that basic noun vocabulary to help give your communication of the content a little bit more meaning. CSS deals with the adjectives of the page. It deals with the way that it looks and feels. It describes not the, con not the content, not the nouns. It describes the style, or as we call it in the web, de the web development world, the presentation. It, it goes in and it, it doesn't actually hook directly into the content, but it hooks into the HTML and it uses those different HTML tags which have defined different parts of the page and it, and it gives those different meaningful parts of the page specific ways of looking. So it can set the font, it can set the color, it can set the size and the shape. It can set anything that you've seen on a web page that looks a certain way the way it looks is set with CSS. CSS has complete power over it. CSS is only concerned with these adjectives. We have to use verbs eventually, right? So when you see web pages that are interactive that you can do things with, that's where JavaScript comes in. So JavaScript comes in and it makes the web page interactive. We make a distinction between static and dynamic web pages. A static web page 
would just be one without any scripts in it that doesn't interact or change. You load it and no matter what you do, you can't change the page. The most you could do is highlight some text and um, if you keep reloading it, it'll always be the exact same page unless the owner updates the page, right? So a dynamic page is one that you can interact with. Things move around. You can click on things. Games can be written in JavaScript. You can have applications that are written in JavaScript. And most web pages today are very interactive and you make heavy use of JavaScript. JavaScript just deals with the verbs of that content. The last part is images and other media. So images and other media can be the content in and of themselves, but most of the time it's text that's the content and you stitch in images, audio, video, and other media into the page, into in the middle of the content as an enhancement to the content. The included media is actually a self-contained file and you have to download that from the server as well and then stitch that into the content. For this in session project we're going to edit some code again and again we're going to use a text editor but from this point on in the course we're actually going to use a different program. Um, it was important for you to understand text editing and for really powerful editing you'll want to still use the text editors that you installed or used on your computer. But we're going to do a cloud text editor from now on to kind of simplify the process for these simpler websites. So this is called shift edit. Shiftedit.net. Go to shiftedit.net. Now you'll notice shiftedit.com is available to come up if you type it in, but that's not the same website. Don't go to shiftedit.com, shiftedit.net. You can install the Chrome extension, but um, you might want to do that later. So go ahead and get started by clicking on the get started link. This is a free account, although obviously there's options to pay for it, but you don't need the paid accounts. You just need a free account for now. Now in the sign up process, you can actually create an account using a third party account. So for example, if you're signed into Google, you can create an account using Google. Click allow. So once you get your account created, go ahead and sign in and get to this screen. If you get to like a welcoming screen first, it'll say access shift edit. So this is the screen that you need to be at. So this is an online text editor combo FTP client. Okay, this will kind of do everything that we did in the last session all and together it at once. It will simplify things. It's a little bit less powerful and it's not as helpful for making you understand the concepts is why I didn't lead with this. So I wanted you to understand how to do this manually first, but this is a simplified way of doing it. So the first thing you'll want to do is set up your connection to your website with FTP. So the way you do that is clicking on this little gear icon. Then you'll be able to choose a site after you've set it up. So right now there's no site here. But right now, to set it up for the first time, click the gear icon and then select new site. Now what this is, is this is that same account information that you put into your FTP client before. So go ahead and get your email that has your Shoutleaf account information and put the information in here. It's very similar, okay? So I'm gonna move this over and then here's that email that I sent to myself. So of course I can, I'm actually gonna make this smaller so we can see both at the same time. I'm going to give it any uh, any nickname that I want for the account. So I'm going to call it Lauren and Brenton. Leave the server type at FTP. Leave that alone. And then go ahead to domain. Now that's your full domain here. And remember, you can use shoutleaf.com since you're pointing it to your your website is actually pointed to the Shoutleaf name servers. Um, so that'll connect you to the same server, shoutleaf.com or your name, just use your name. So mine is laurenandbrenton.com, including the top level domain part of the domain name. So .com, .net, .org, whatever. And then go ahead and put your username. That username is the same username you got here. And then the password, copy and paste your password. And go ahead and save that by default. Um, now the directory, this will let you choose which directory to start with by default. So um, you actually probably can't change that until you first 
logged in at least once. Um, but you will want to go back and set this to www or public underscore HTML so that you don't have to navigate up to public underscore HTML every time. And then this is the web URL. I'll leave that alone. So go ahead and do test connection before moving on. If you get an error like this, it's because you entered something wrong in one of these fields. You either messed with the server type to not be FTP, you either didn't put your domain correctly with the .com, or one of these other options. Directory and web URL, I think you wouldn't mess it up, but anything from server type, domain, username, or password, if there's any mistake in any of these, then your connection is not going to make it correctly. It's also possible that you haven't set up your domain pointed to the Shoutleaf name servers correctly or that I haven't created an account for you yet. But if you did this last time with your FTP in the last session, then it's probably just an issue right here. So I, I said I intentionally put the wrong password in, so let me correct that and then we can move on. So now that you have connected, you can go in and change the starting directory. Um, you're going to look for www or public underscore HTML. There's actually a quirk with the way that this works. You can see how the www directory has been renamed to this longer name. So this actually kind of breaks it. It's indicating that this is a shortcut. Um, instead, pick public underscore HTML. You can see how this works and this doesn't. So pick public underscore HTML as your default startup directory. So you don't, when you log in, you don't get presented with all this and have to find it each time and then navigate up to it public underscore HTML, don't go into it, just the folder there and choose that folder. There, now you are connected there and you can save your connection. Great, so you can see that I have logged in. Let me close this. Now I'm connected to my server with FTP right here on the left here. Now I've got a bunch of these tabs that keep opening. Um, now this is a way to create a new file um, and you're gonna start with HTML. But first notice that you've already got your file over here. Um, whatever it was that you named it, it's right here. And hopefully you gave it the .html extension. So this is a way of editing the files on the cloud directly. So you won't have to do that whole uploading in between each edit. So if you just click on it once, nothing's going to happen actually. So to edit it, you have to either double click it or right click. Now, I want to explain this just so you don't get confused. If you right click, you're going to get confused by some of these settings because if you wanted to edit, you'd think you'd go in here, but these don't really do what you expect. Um, and then new would be creating a new item not related to this file that you clicked on. If you want to right click to edit, you have to go to open. It's a little bit unintuitive and not one of these opens, this open. But instead, just double click on it. This brings it open and you can see the file that you uploaded previously. So here it is, hello world. Let's go to my website to kind of see what it is that I've got here just to remind us. So here's laurenandbrenton.com and there's that file. And remember I can type forward slash hello that HTML and I can see my document there. Okay, so now I've got this window open, this tab and this tab with the, uh, with the file on the cloud being edited. I don't need this tab anymore. So I'm actually going to pull these, pull this out, make your so windows that I've got it in a separate next window, other, not just a separate and tab. I'm going to make it, and then I'm going to make it so that I can see both at the same time because I'm going to be going back and forth. So go ahead and do that as well. All right. So. Let's go ahead and make a change. So I just made a change here, and note I did not save it, and a little asterisk comes up here indicating that a change has been made to the document and it has not been saved. So without saving, what happens if I refresh on laurenandbrenton.com? Nothing, okay? But if I save it, here's the save icon. Save, saving hello, and now that little asterisk goes away. Now if I refresh on my website, on, on the internet live, you see my change. So this is cool because by saving, it did more than one thing. It saved it and it did the FTP all for me and it made it all connect and it simplified the process a lot. So I didn't 
I didn't have to manually upload it with FTP. You can think of it as you're actually directly logged into your website, saving your files on your website live. So you can think of this as a live editor, live website editor making changes. Before we continue, we're going to have to take a step back and look at how to actually label things with sticky notes in HTML the way we did in my kitchen. So what I've done here is I have gone into a text editor and written up all of the content of my kitchen. So up at the top here, I have kitchen, and then within the kitchen is all the things on my counter. Um, the wine glass is on the counter, the knife block is on the counter, within the knife block is a bunch of knives, and then everything else, the shelves in my cabinet, and the pot rack, and the pots. So, say for example, I need to tell the browser how to understand that this is flour. So, we can't just, in a text editor, take a sticky note and like stick it on top of the flour because this is a text editor. This this just won't work. So we have to find a way of actually putting the tag actually in the text. So how would you go ahead and do that? Well, one thing you can try is creating a little tag by hand. You note that you have these little brackets and you can use them to make a thing that looks kind of like a tag. And now maybe the browser will know, okay, this is the flower tag and it's indicating that this is flower. But the problem with this is that if the browser is reading through, how is it going to know that this flower tag goes to this and not to this? It's a little bit complicated in a text editor to indicate one thing. Whereas in real life, you can just stick the sticky note on top of it. In a text editor, you need to figure out ways to delineate which thing you're actually pointing to. So this isn't going to work because it doesn't actually indicate where I'm pointing. It could kind of go anywhere. So another way to do this might be to do something like, okay, I want to indicate that it's this right here. So if you look on your keyboard at the comma and period keys, you'll see little arrows. I call them carrots. And if you hit the shift key, you can make a little pointer here and I can point to flower. And I might also need to indicate when to stop looking at flower so that the browser doesn't just keep reading onto beans as well. So I'm going to make another arrow pointing to the other side of flower. So now with this little syntax, the carrots or the arrows pointing, I know that everything between these two arrows is flower. Uh, oops except not because I have to write the tag in here too. So this isn't quite going to work either because the browser needs to know that this is the tag and not just another word like sugar. So I need a way to, to mark the beginning of the tag as well as writing the tag name and pointing to where the, what the tag is indicating starts and where it ends. So the way we do this in HTML is with another one of these little arrows. So now this looks kind of like a tag, right? It's starting to shape up. It looks like it's one cohesive little thing, kind of like this, except it's pointy on the edges. So this is a good strategy so far, but it, it won't quite work. The flaw with this is that it's going to have trouble understanding that this little pointer ender is the end of flower and not something that started up here. Say for example, I wanted to indicate that this was all the counter. I might do something like this. Counter and then down here end the counter, right? But then what we've got is the browser is like, okay, this is all counter and then when it gets to here, What's ending? Is the counter ending or is flower ending? The browser doesn't know. So what we need to do is whenever we have one of these end pointing arrows, we need to indicate what's ending. And the way we do that is by typing the tag name again, flower. And same thing here with beans. 
Now, this is yet again not sufficient because how does the browser know that I'm not starting a new flower right here and then everything between here and then, then the next closing flower is flower. So we need a way to differentiate a starting flower tag from an ending flower tag. And what we can use is this little forward slash. It's like a slash that says no, stop, this isn't it. So flower and then slash, no more flower. So this is beginning flower, this is ending flower. So this is the tag and it's got these little arrows that point to what's in between the starting and ending tag and everything in between those two er arrows is flower. So remember it's a forward slash and not a backslash. The forward slash is like leaning forward like a little guy leaning forward and it's right next to the little caret tag. So that's easy to remember. Just always go right next to them. So this is the syntax for how to mark up a, um, a page with HTML to tell the browser what it means. Now, of course, in real HTML, there's no such tag as flour and beans. This is my kitchen, but this would be the way to do it. Now, we're gonna have to go down here. Remember, I put this little closing tag from counter. Need to go down here and make sure that I have stop counter. Okay, now can you kind of see how I would mark up the rest of this? Continuing your in-class project, we're going to actually write some HTML. So do this along with me as I talk. Pause as you go. So um, right now, this page has an emphasized word. This is a cloud change. Now this is not semantically marked up. And as we know, HTML is about semantics. So right now, if somebody who is blind is using a screen reader, what the screen reader will do when it loads this page is it will say, hello world, this is a cloud change and it won't actually emphasize the word cloud. So what we need to do is use HTML to mark this up so that a screen reader will know that it's emphasized text and it'll say, this is a cloud change. It'll actually emphasize, it'll change the way that it says the word cloud, okay? So the way to do that in HTML is with the emphasize tag, which is EM. So go ahead and put EM around it. Now also, it's rude to shout on the internet, and all capitals indicates shouting on the internet. It just looks tacky, so let's make it lowercase as well. Now this way, we're not changing our content with presentational stuff and with uh, semantic stuff. We're putting the, the semantics into the HTML where it belongs instead of in our content, and then we can make it look the way we want later with CSS. We'll get into that later though. So make this change and save it. So pause as you go and, and do this along with me. So after you've saved it here, you should see when you reload this page, same, same exact page, hello.html, same one we've been working on, it changes. It's now HTML emphasized. So you'll see that it is italic. Now EM is not exactly the same as italic. EM has a semantic meaning, a meaningful meaning of emphasized. There's also an I tag, which means italic. Now the I tag has a semantic meaning of something like a, a, some text that's set apart. So you would use an I tag semantically for situations where you have, for example, the, the name of a ship or a foreign word, something that we typographically usually italicize for a reason that it's, it's set off typographically. Okay, so that's different than EM. So just because you want something to be italicized, say you're using the name of a boat, you wouldn't use the EM tag for that. You'd use the I tag that would make it italicized. And just because something is emphasized, you don't want it to necessarily always be italic. You might, you, you might be tempted to use the I tag for something that's emphasized, but it's not the same thing. The I tag indicates something else. Furthermore, you don't always have your text that's emphasized italic. It, have you ever seen a website where emphasized text is underlined or bolded or made a different color or made a different font size? There are different ways of doing this. So don't get confused about the default look the HTML gives it. Think about the semantics. So we've written some HTML and you see how this works. The EM goes around 
the part that is emphasized. So what this is doing is this word cloud is emphasized and everything else is not emphasized. If I wanted two words to be emphasized, I could drag this, cut, paste, and save. And now both of those words are emphasized. This is a cloud change. So both are emphasized. And let me go ahead and show you another tag. This right now is actually a paragraph. So let's mark it up as a paragraph. This is the P tag. And note that when you, when you write in some contexts, shift edit will automatically give you the closing tag. So anything that's in here is a paragraph. Now we wanted it to go on this, so I'm gonna cut this second closing part and go to the end of the line, hit return to go below, and then paste it. So now you see that from here, drag down to here, everything that's highlighted is a paragraph now, according to HTML. So when you save it, and refresh, there's no change that you see, but the page semantically now has this meaning imbued into it. You've given it the meaning of this is a paragraph. This is going to improve your Google search ranking. It's, it's going to make it more accessible to people who have different disabilities. It's going to make it more uh, connected to the rest of the web. So you want to have this semantic meaning even when it doesn't look a certain way. Later we can come in with CSS and we can target paragraphs to make them look a certain way if we want. What I'm going to have you do is actually create in this same exact same thing here, the same hello.html or whatever file name you gave it. Don't, don't create a new page yet. Just within this, what I want you to do is expand this page a little bit. I want you to give it a title, a heading, another paragraph, and a list of links to some of your classmate domains. Now don't get tripped up. There's This assignment is a little bit of a trick assignment. It's kind of like a trick question. I'm giving you an assignment and there's a part of this that you won't know how to do unless you already know how to do it from somewhere else. I haven't told you how to do how to complete this completely yet. So when you get to the point where you have no idea how to do what I've just assigned you, don't worry about it. Just continue on. It, it'll make more sense to you when I explain it. If you've already tried it on your own and saw the need for why this is, then if you just hear it straight out from the beginning, from the outset. So this is a teaching tool I'm using to help you to remember and understand the reason that we do things a certain way. So don't get tripped up when you get to that point when you can't figure it out. So again, what you're going to do is you're going to expand this page a little bit. You're going to give it a title, which is the title for the entire page. Then you're going to give it a heading. And then below here, you're going to put another paragraph. And then list of links to classmate pages. So obviously, you're going to find the links to your classmate pages in the project section. And furthermore, after you write up the content for this, you're also going to mark it up semantically. So the way you're going to do that is you're going to use these elements. So I'm not going to show you how to do this. I'm going to let you figure out how to use the H1 tag for a page heading. You already saw the paragraph tag for the paragraph. And then you're going to have the list item tag, which will mark which will denote that something is a list item, okay? So go ahead and pause the video now and complete this little in-class session project. Don't, don't get tripped up when you don't know how to do something. Just do everything you can, and then once you've done everything you can, unpause the video and continue. Okay, so hopefully you didn't have too much trouble with that. So here I have done the assignment as well. The first part, I have just put together the content. So here I've made the title here. Whoops, undo that. Control or Command Z to undo. Okay, this is the title. This is my heading. This is that paragraph that we wrote together. And then this is my paragraph that I wrote. Now note how it, it just continues along off screen. It goes all the way out here, way out here. That's fine, I'm just gonna leave it like that. And then here is my list of links to my classmates' pages. 
These are the pages that had the most likes in the project section. So if we save this now without marking it up with HTML, let's see what happens. Kind of a mess. There's just a lot of uh, strung together mess here. And it, it gets worse as I change the size of the page, right? It's, it's all just strung together. Actually, the only thing that's not strung together is the part where we did this little paragraph. This is nicely segmented out. But Brenton's page, the title, and then my heading are all strung together, and this is all strung together. So this isn't good. Let's write some HTML to clean it up. So Brenton's page, I want to be the title. This was part of the trick. I didn't give you the HTML for writing the title. It's a little confusing, so we're going to come back to it. Next, you have the heading. So there's a difference, right? The heading, the, the HTML for is H1. So you should have your, hopefully if you did it right, your code should look like this. H1, the content of the H1, and stop H1. So everything from this to this, that's the H1. If we save this and look at it, now we can tell that the HTML has imbued the meaning of first level header. If you were to guess, what would you guess that the code for second level header is? So we already wrote this. Let's leave that alone. Now this is a paragraph. So I'm going to write again P. And then at the end, or actually what will be easier is if I just put it right here. Stop P. Close P. So this is the P element. And now if I save it, and go over here and refresh, we should see some distinction between this paragraph and what follows after. Good. Okay, now I gave you the li tag to in indicate that something is a list item. So what I've done right here, um, you can see this is just not going to work because it's all on one line. So if I give it um, an li around each of these. What I did, I kind of tried to put formatting into it as I was writing this because I put each of these on a new line and I gave it this little dash and you can see it didn't work. It works when it's small because it, it wraps the long words, but it doesn't work at any other size because there's not real formatting here. So this little dash here, I, I typed it not because it's actually part of my content, but because I was trying to format it. But formatting formally is the job of CSS and for HTML to give it the meaning for the CSS. So we're going to delete these little dashes that I put in there because they're not properly content. So I'm going ahead, I'm deleting all of them. And now I'm going to put the li elements in here. Now, of course, it's very important that you always type it exactly the correct way. So if I if I want to save time, what I will do is copy this open li and do all of them once. So this one, this one, paste, paste, paste. And then remembering to keep everything clean, the close li, paste, 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 paste. Now the HTML should know that all these are list items. Save and refresh. Perfect. So this is looking a lot better. So here's the tricky part. I told you to put links, but what this is, is this is URLs. So I didn't actually tell you how to put links. Now I gave you the A element, the A tag, and so you could try to link these with A and then stop A. But when you save it and look at it, you can tell that it's not really working, okay? And furthermore, you want to be able to say the name of this person rather than always showing the URL. What would be really nice is if you could just put the name, the oh, any word you want, and then anchor the URL into it. In order to get links to work right, we're going to have to learn something new. Let's look at our little fake kitchen example again. So now it's marked up in fake HTML style syntax. And you can see that I've got tags for all the different things on my counter, all of the individual wine glasses, 
each knife in my knife block, and then that's the end of the counter. Now here comes the cabinet with different shelves, plates, bowls, and things like that. Now at the bottom is the pot rack. So in the pot rack, there's a problem because all the pots look the same, but they're actually different sizes. You can see a three quart, a two quart. So how are we gonna tell with the tag that this pot is a different size than the other pot? Well, what you do is you write an attribute on the pot. So we need to specify the size. The size of this pot is three quarts. So we write size equals three quarts. This is a little attribute that goes in the tag itself. And then we put the whole tag back on the pot. And now we know that this pot is three quarts. So what we wanna do is go ahead and mark up each of these individually as their different sizes. So obviously if we're gonna write information about this pot, we need to put the information inside this tag. Now this is just the closing tag. Nothing ever goes in here. It has to go in here. Now we wanna put it after the name of the tag that says it's a pot. So we'll put it right here. Never put it before because then the browser will get confused. Now let's write the attribute name, size. And then we have to set what it is equal to. Three quarts. Let's go ahead and do that with all the other ones. Okay, now I've given most of these sizes. It may be that some of the pots don't actually need to have the size attribute because it doesn't really apply. For example, some of my saucepans, the size doesn't matter as much, so I'm gonna leave that out. Now we should know how to put the URL into the anchor tag so that we can see the text, but the anchor has the URL as an attribute that'll tell the browser where to take us when we click on that text. So there's, for archaic reasons, we call this an anchor and a hyperreference. So the anchor tag will go around not the hyperreference or the URL, I'm gonna cut this, but around the word that you want. So this is project grandma. So if I save this, this is getting closer to how we're supposed to do it. Project Grandma. Now this is how I want the link to look, except I want to be able to click on it and have it take me to that URL that I just cut out of here. So how do we make this anchor have the hyperreference or the URL linked into it? The way to do this is with an attribute. This element can have an attribute. Now an attribute always goes right here, and the attribute name it, it, for the hyperreference is h ref, hyper reference. And now note that because I'm in this syntax highlighting program, shift edit, when I hit space, I get a little list of possible attributes. Now, I want you to remember that the attributes go in the first, the opening, not in the closing element. So if I try to put it here, I don't get that little list because it doesn't ever go there. Nothing ever goes here except the closing demarcator and the element name that you're closing. It goes right here, after the name of the element, but before the tag actually closes. So put a space and you see, oh, there's some suggested attributes. And the attribute that we want for a hyperreference is href stands for hyperreference. So the href is going to be, and I'm gonna paste in the link. The hyperreference is that link. So let's save it and refresh. It's turned into a link. So now it's an anchor that has the hyperreference linked in there, uh, anchored in there. And you can see at the bottom that the little preview text comes up. If I click on this, it'll take me to Project Grandma. So let's go back. What if there, there's a, one more thing we need to do with this attribute? If this attribute, which, which the attribute name is href hyperreference equals, and then what it equals is the URL, the actual hyperreference. So this is attribute name, attribute value. The values can be really different. There, are, It's actually valid to have a file name that has a space in it. But say, 
she had named it hello space world. This is going to cause problems for us because of the way the HTML reads this. Let's refresh and see. What it did is it did a, it tried to take me to projectgrammar.com slash hello nothing because it saw this space and it thought I was done. So what we need to always do is put quotes around our attribute values every single time. Every single attribute value attribute value will always have quotes around it. And this will fix a lot of issues and it'll keep your syntax clean. So go back, refresh. And now if I click on it, it gives me the whole URL up here. Hello. And then it, it's put this code that means space in there, world. Now, she didn't actually create the page hello world. I made that up. She created the page hello. So that's why it's not found. But you can see that up here, the actual full URL made its way in. So let's go back and let's fix this to what her actual page is. So go ahead and put a href equals for all of these links. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to actually, I'm going to do it a quick way. Since these already have the URL here, I'm going to copy just a href equals copy and put it before these URLs. See how tricky this is, but it saves a lot of time. And then I'm going to copy this part, the closing quote and the closing caret, and I'm going to paste it on the end of the other end of this URL. And you'll see the syntax highlighting changing as I do this because I was creating errors by doing it the wrong way. But now when I finish it up, it's all clean. And now I need, so here's the beginning of the anchor. I also need to close it. So for each one, I'm going to go ahead and copy this, paste right here. It has to be exactly right there. And now... I can fill in the anchor for each of these. So if I save this, what's going to happen when I refresh this? You should be able to have an idea that, okay, so I wrote project grandma here, but here there's nothing between nothing in the anchor tag. There's the value of the attribute, the hyperreference. So the hyperreference is there, but the actual anchor has no content to it. So, whoops. I think I did save all that but there's only one document open. So save. So if I refresh, what's going to happen to these URLs? I've moved these URLs into the attribute, and now the actual anchor has no content. They all disappear, and there's nothing here. That's because the, attribute has no, the anchor has no content. So I'm going to go ahead and give words to each of these. Now go to save, and then refresh. Now they all show up, and they should work. I can click on each of these and go back. And look, this person actually already wrote some HTML because there's some emphasized or italicized text here. Not sure if they use the emphasis tag or the italics tag because I can't see their code. And look, this person wrote some sort of HTML as well because they have some formatting here. I wonder what code they used. But we we can see the source of our web page, but we can't see the source of their web pages. Well, you can, but I'll tell you how to do that later. One question I have is, did any of you, when you were creating this list the first time around, instead of using dashes like I did, did you use numbers? Did you do one, two, three, four, five instead of dash or bullet point? There's a difference in types of lists. There is an ordered list, which would be one, two, three, four, five, and there's an unordered list. So we actually, there's a way to mark up this entire list as being one or the other, and it's actually required. A list item always should be either ordered or unordered, and the way we do that is we put the beginning tag here and the closing tag here, and the element for ordered list is ol, the element for unordered list is ul. So I did mine with dashes because I didn't want it to be ordered. There's no mean there's no meaning in the order. They're just it's just a random order. So I'm going to do ul unordered list. 
and you see that it automatically gave me the closing tag, I don't need it there, cut. I need it down here, paste. So now what this says is that here is an ordered list from here to here. That's an ordered list. And this is a list item. There's all these list items. So the only thing that goes inside, directly inside an order list is a list item. So don't get confused when you see this UL begin and then it, it doesn't stop even though another one is started. What this means is that this list item is inside this unordered list. It doesn't mean that this unordered list is first and this is the next one. This is actually underneath, inside the UL. Going back to our kitchen example, this is like how you can locate the pots as within the pot rack. The pot rack starting arrow is right here and it goes down to this other arrow here and you can see that all the pots are nested underneath the pot rack element. They're inside of it. And that makes sense because they are all on the pot rack. And of course as we scroll up we can find that while the counter ends and there's a new thing called the cabinet, the cabinet is composed of shelves. There's a couple of shelves and then the shelves contain things like plates. So this makes perfect sense. You have to go to the cabinet and open it up and then there's shelves. You look inside the cabinet, you find various shelves until you find the shelf that has what you're looking for on it. And then inside that shelf, you can, you can find your plates and bowls and the things that you're actually looking for. Now, of course, all of this is inside of the kitchen, which is also indicated in our little example of fake code. The kitchen is at the very top, and then if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, here's the closing kitchen tag. So everything between this arrow pointing up and this arrow pointing down is inside the kitchen. Another way that, we, that programmers talk about it is this is a parent and this is a child, or this li, it has an ancestor, that is the ul. And this ul has a descendant, that is the li. And we have a similar thing going on here with the li and the anchor tag. The anchor tag is actually inside the list item. It's not the next one after. We can't put close li because we want to surround the anchor. So the anchor tag, the anchor element, is a child of the li element, which is a child of the ul. So, okay, answer this as you're watching this video right now. This li right here that I'm highlighting, what is its relationship to this ul? Say it. It's the child. This is the child of this. Now, what is this li's relationship to this li? If you said child, you're, you're actually not right, but you're thinking through it, which is good. They're actually siblings. And that's the actual technical term. These are siblings. They're all children of this UL, so they're all siblings of each other. Now here's another question. This A, what would you say its relationship is to this LI? It's not sibling because they're not both children of the same parent. You, this isn't, we don't actually have a technical name for it, but it's something like uncle, right? This is this is the child of this ally and this is a sibling so your your parents sibling is your uncle or aunt there's not actually a technical term for that but what's important is that you don't think that this anchor is a sip whoops undo you don't think that this anchor is a sibling to this ally or a descendant of this ally this anchor is only a, a descendant of this ally now what is this anchors this anchors um, relationship to this unordered list element. Not a parent because it's one step up. It's a grandparent or the more general technical term is just ancestor. Good, so hopefully this is not too confusing for you if you're just starting out with HTML. Now one other thing we got to get to is that we have defined a lot with this page to save and just refresh. We've defined a lot of information here. Now you see when I when I made that change because I put the UL in, it just popped this out a little bit and separated it out as an unordered list. So now it'll actually know that it's an unordered list. But we haven't actually indicated that all of this is an HTML document. 
That's something we actually need to do. And there is an element for it called HTML that indicates that the page is being written in HTML code. So we need to always put this in our HTML documents. Whoops, and it, we, it, it filled that in for me, which is kind of helpful and kind of not. So the whole thing, all of it is HTML, okay? Every bit of it is HTML. So the very first line of all of your HTML documents should be always HTML. Okay, there's a caveat to that in the future, but I'll leave it for now. From what you know, everything is, the first line will be HTML, and the last line will be close HTML. Everything in here is HTML. Save, what's gonna happen when I refresh? Nothing, it was a semantic change, and it allowed the browser to understand what it's reading. Now here's another issue. This title, I want to get on the title of the page up here. Right now it says the URL because I didn't give it a title, but how do I get it up there? Because this is in the page, it just puts it down here in the page. So what I need is kind of like a way to give some like meta information about the page. I don't actually want to put this title in the like main body of the page. I want to put it like up above, up in here, like in, I need to like have a section that gives special information about the page, but that isn't actually part of the document body yet. So as you're thinking about this, if you're really, really clever, you're probably imagining what the name of that tag is. And you're probably imagining something like there's a tag named document that you put around the entire document, open document, close document. And then you have another tag that you would call something like, if you're making this up, what would you come up with? Maybe you're imagining it's called something like meta. If you had any thought along those lines, you are absolutely brilliant. If you didn't, that's okay. You might still be brilliant, but you, you wouldn't know what the actual names of the elements are. But if you guessed, that, that's pretty good. So what the actual names of the elements are, it's not document and meta. What it is, is to indicate that this is the document body, the element name is body. And you put this body element, you put this body tag, command cut, command paste, or, or control cut, control paste, around the entire document body. So it doesn't go don't put it behind this HTML because the body element, the body of the document is part of the HTML, right? So you, and also it wouldn't be, it wouldn't fit together right because this body element starts after this. They need to be nested inside. This body is a child of this HTML tag. So this, this now tells the computer that all of this from the end of the body tag to the beginning of the closed body tag is the document body. Now we save it, and it doesn't quite make a change yet because there's actually syntax error. This, this is outside of the body. Um, there's the second element that we put in, or a second tag, and we call this head. This is head information. It's like header information that goes not, it's not actually in the document. It's like up above it, like just like hidden. It's, this is where you put all the information on the page that's hidden that relates to the entire page. Okay, so it's kind of like how in a person, the head contains all the knowledge and everything. This is the knowledge that applies to the entire page. Now if we save this and refresh, it's still not working. Why isn't it working? Because we have to indicate what type of head information this is. Now the, the correct way to do this is with, if we're going to give it a title, and by the way, you can always do this and see what, what HTML is available to you. I did the open caret key and I stopped. And now this shift edit, because it's a syntax highlighting and it's an HTML editor, it's given me some suggestions that are kind of appropriate to this area. So, hmm, which one is it? I wanted it to be the title, there it is. So I can actually click that and it fills in title for me. Now I need to finish typing it, close, and then, stop title now now the page will work now it will work save this should disappear and watch up here when i refresh there it is brenton's page so now if you've been going along with this and and fixing up your page as you go 
it's okay if you didn't get it all ahead of time it wasn't like a, a test but if you got it if you've got it now get your page to do all of this stuff you've completed the project this is this is a huge monumental step you've gone from somebody who didn't know what HTML was, how to save a web page, how to make a web page, to somebody who's writing HTML and creating a web page on the internet. This is a real web page in every sense. It has HTML, it's on its own domain, it's being served over the internet, publicly available through HTTP, it's coded, it's semantic. You are a web maker. And if you just, if you stop taking the course now, you would have the foundational knowledge that would put you 10 steps above most people who don't know any of this stuff already. When we write code, it's very important to keep things organized. This is a really simple site so far, and it's already starting to look complicated. So what we usually do when we have things that are nested, like here, for example, we have a UL and an LI, we usually indent the, ch the child elements. Now I'm indenting by hitting the tab button. One tab per nest or per layer deep it is. Now another trick is that we don't usually indent this sort of thing. So this is this is like within a line. So if you were to look at our page again, the UL, when we added it, it kind of like made a line break here and a line break here. It made it like a block, a, its own block. So um, we usually will indent those, but this list item and the anchor are like on the same line, and we don't usually indent that. So I wouldn't go, I wouldn't do this typically, although you could if you really were confused and needed it to be clear, and I've done this sometimes. So this is one way of doing it, and if you really wanted to get excessive, you could even indent and do this. And note how the IDE, uh, note how the how this text editor is helping me by kind of uh, helping where my indentations go when I hit return. So if you wanted to, you could you could indent like this to just make it very clear that project grandma is inside of this anchor tag, which is inside of this list item, which is inside of this unordered list block. But that's a little bit redundant. It's usually easier to put items that are kind of like in the same line all on the same line. Likewise, up here, we wouldn't try and put this in a new line and indent it because this is kind of like, it breaks up the flow of the sentence. This is a cloud change. So I'm gonna go back and undo that because it's kind of like an inline thing. However, this paragraph blocks it out onto like its own little block. So we are gonna leave that and I'm gonna indent this and this. So you'll note that if, as we go through and indent all of this and clean up any blank spaces, that sometimes you want to indent a lot of things. So I want to indent everything that's inside this body from here to here. So I can either go one at a time, or there's a couple of tricks you can use. So I can just highlight everything I want to indent, as long as there's multiple lines, and hit tab, and it does all of them for you. Tab, 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 it'll keep doing it. Now, what if you wanna take them all back when indentation? You can use a special character combination called Shift Tab. Now, this is not universal. Some good text editors will have some of these shortcuts and some won't. So you have gotta get familiar with the text editor you're using. But most of the advanced ones have Tab when you have multiple lines selected to indent all of them and then to unindent hit shift, hold it, and then type tab to unindent. And so you just hold shift, and when you're holding shift and you hit tab, it goes back in indentation. When you're not holding shift and you hit tab, it goes forward. So I'm gonna continue clearing all of this up. HTML and body are both inside of the HTML element. Sorry, I meant, H I meant body and body and head are both inside of the HTML element. So now, our text is a little bit cleaner and easier to look at. Um, it may look more confusing to you now, but when you get to a very full, big, confusing page, it's gonna be able, it's gonna be helpful for you to be able 
to kind of get your bearings of how nested, how deep in something is by looking at the indentation. Now it also brings to light some issues. Like for example, this text right here on line 13 is actually a direct child of the body element. It's not nested under anything else. Now that's kind of a warning sign because what that means is that the only semantic meaning that this text has is that it's HTML in the document body. So it actually has no semantic meaning beyond just that it's a web page. It's part of a web page. So usually that's an indication that something is awry. And what we actually need to do is give this a paragraph tag around it because it is a paragraph. Whoops, I, uh, I double typed that and it, it helped me out there. Okay, so this is, this is uh, a block level paragraph. That's why I put it on its own new line. And now you may note that I, I'm kind of like being inconsistent in my indentation with these paragraphs. I have created a new line and indented and with this one I just put it straight in here. Um, that's not a bad thing to be inconsistent, but for the most part, it's probably good if you try for consistency, especially um, when you're beginning, until you develop certain habits that help you in your coding. So now if I save this and refresh, you'll actually see no changes, because all I've done is change the way that I've formatted it for me to see, not the way I've formatted it for anybody else to see it. It's not changing the HTML format, and I did change the semantics of this paragraph, but it didn't actually change the way it looked. So here is the source of the page right here. This is, this is the code that's behind this. Now, I don't, what if I want to look at the code on this page without getting this whole shift edit opened up and finding the file, what if I just want to check really quick about what this looks like? Okay, like for example, I want to go to Sam Gildia's page, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, and I want to see how he did this. I can't log in to his account. I don't have his account. He didn't give his password out. Hopefully he didn't. But what I can do is I can actually get at the code that's behind it. I can get the source of how this was built. And the way you do that is from the browser. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Or actually what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag it over to this side of the screen. Because what I'm going to show you is in this little menu. Now every, every operating system and every browser has a different place that you have the menu item. But in Chrome, you go in here and then go to Tools. And you can see this item, this menu item right here, View Source. And the shortcut for that is Option Command U. On almost all Windows computers, the shortcut for it is Control U. So if you're in Windows, don't even try and find the menu icon. Just always type Control U to do this, to find View Source. On a lot of other computers, you'll need to go View and find Source. In Chrome, on Mac, it's not like that. But so go to Tools and View Source. OK, so let me open this back up. Did you see what it did there? It opened a new tab. So this is the page I was on. This was Sam's page. And now opened this tab with the source. You see that it says View Source here. And it has the same URL or the same uh, location. And it shows the actual source. You've got line numbers. And I can see the elements he used. So I can see that he used the I tag, which is good because if he'd used the EM tag, that would mean semantically that this entire sentence is emphasized, which would be a little bit weird. However, it's not really a, this isn't really a, um, a foreign word or a special term, so it's still not quite semantically correct. So um, in the future, we'll use CSS. And what we'll do is we'll use a semantically correct tag and then use CSS to make it italicized so that it can look the way he wants without being semantically incorrect. But I'll teach you how to do that later. So we can also see things like he's put line breaks in here, one before and one after this italicized part, which doesn't show up. So we can see a lot of this stuff just for anybody to see on any website. So 
You can do this on any website. Go to any website you want and check out the source. Let's go to Skillshare and check out the source. I have a shortcut right here. Okay, for me, it's Control, I'm sorry, it's Option, Command, U. If you're on Windows, it's Control, U. Okay, so Skillshare.com, I'm viewing the source. Here's the source. Check it out. You can see this on any page. And you can, you can look through and you can find out, figure out, for the most part, how they did things. This is actually one of the biggest learning tools that you have, is the view source command. Just go ahead and view the source of any page when you're curious about how they did something. How did they get this Skillshare picture there? You can view the source, and because this is a very complicated page, there's a lot of code to scroll through. But eventually, um, you'll be able to find it. Now, I'm able to find it a little bit quicker because I do, I've did, done this for a living. So I can tell you right now, this is the code for this picture right here. I can see that right away. Now it'll take you a while to get to that point, but you'll get there eventually because you'll you'll be able to read all of these extra little things that'll make sense of just like parse in. So you're at the part where you're like learning individual letters and you're thinking, how can anybody read all of those letters individually and form words and then f read those words together so quickly that they can read it as fast as they talk. I remember thinking that when I was learning how to read. I was figuring out just the letters one at a time. That's a K. That's a I. And then here's somebody who knows how to read just brrrp, is reading entire sentences almost as soon as they see it. So this is where you're at right now is one letter at a time. But you're going to pick it up really quickly. Since I've highlighted this for you, we can see Look at this, images slash logo dash slim dot PNG. And I can actually click on it in some browsers. Most browsers, if you have a newer browser, will allow you to click on URLs within the, um, within the page and it understands the context. But I'm going to right click on it and do new tab. And we'll see that this is the image. It's the same image that was right there. So you can, you can get a lot done. This is very powerful. And note here, they didn't put the full URL. So how do they do that? This forward slash at the beginning of where the URL should be indicates that it's, rel it's a relative path that starts right at the end of the domain, right there. So if you ever see this, or if you ever um, put a link that, that doesn't have the full domain, it just is relative to, the, to starting with a slash, then this is, this is how it works. We'll talk about it later, but there's just like a lot of stuff that as you're looking through, you're gonna run into tons of different cool things that you wanna learn how to do, and viewing the source is gonna show you how to do it. There are a couple of things that you always need to write when you create a, a web page. Um, you always need to write HTML, head, and body. So it always has HTML with head and body nested within it. Also, you'll always want a title. And there's some other things. So what we call when you, when you have a, a, a bunch of repetitive code that is always required and you don't want to keep writing it, so you kind of like create it and in a place where you can copy and paste from it or copy and paste the files, we call that a boilerplate. It's like a little template that you use to like get you started for like how you're going to build your page. So if you always have this HTML head, body, etc. stuff when you're making your page, you might want to like go ahead and do that. And you might even want to do something like if your titles always start with a certain phrase and then you add a little bit more in afterwards, include that in your boilerplate as well. And then when you start with your boilerplate, you won't have to do that redundant repetitive stuff. You'll have a good start ready for you already. Now this shift edit actually has a kind of a little boilerplate built in. I told you not to do this before because I wanted to show it to you now. But if you go to the new tab, and if you click a new tab here, it's the same thing, I'll close that. You go to a new tab and you create using one of these little guys. I'm gonna drag this back out because we can look at it now. If you create one of these pages, and don't even worry about all this stuff. We're not going to get into that at all. But you will get into HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And if you're interested, maybe even PHP. But create an HTML page and look at what comes up. There's a little boilerplate that 
does all this stuff for you. Remember how we had to type HTML, close HTML, head, close head, title, close title, body, close body. And it even puts a space between the body tags so that you can begin writing the document body, the content for your page. And if you didn't title it, it gives you the title untitled. Now there's a couple of special things in here. It's giving you a meta character set. This is a very special tag that goes in the head that tells the browser what character set you're using. You probably shouldn't add this in until this becomes an issue for you. It, most of the time now, UTF-8 is the best character set to use. This program knows that it's using the UTF-8 character set, so don't worry about this. Just leave this alone. Remember in previous um, lecture when I showed you how to save in plain text, you may have seen that there was an option to change the character set, and I said just leave it. That's because it, if you had changed it and then saved it without resetting it to the correct character set, you'll get weird things like you get a bunch of question marks or blocks or things if the character set isn't correct. So just leave this alone. Uh, most of the time UTF-8 is what your character set will be, but um, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to delete this, but you don't have to add it when you're writing your own code. It'll usually take care of itself. The other thing that is new in this little boilerplate that I didn't show you is this. Now remember that little caveat when I said that HTML is always the first line of a document? It wasn't really a caveat, it was just a straight up lie. The first line of every document is actually the doc type. The doc type is a special way of defining what type of HTML you're coding in. There's actually multiple versions of HTML. Well, there used to be. Nowadays, we've realized that having multiple versions of HTML kind of causes problems, and it did cause a lot of problems in the past. There was HTML uh, 3, there was HTML 4 and 4.1, there was the transitional standards and uh, non-standard versions. We had a version of HTML that began to be colloquially known as tag soup HTML because it didn't have a doc type and it didn't follow the syntax properly. It didn't follow the standards. And so it was just tags kind of like thrown together in a soup and the browser had to figure out what to do with it. And for the most part, browsers are pretty good at figuring it out. So this is what the old doc types used to look like. It used to be that you would have to do all of this. You would define your root element and then there's all these other like little parts of it. So let's see an example. Here's the doc type for XHTML1. Look at how ridiculously long it is. It doesn't even fit on the page. It includes things like a link to the specification, um, the language. Here's HTML4, just regular old HTML4.01. Look at this mess. And there's multiple version types of HTML4. This is standards. This is a transitional, which is a little bit looser. You might see the word loose. And then there's another version for if you were using frames. Um, so all these different doc types, what a mess. We don't do that anymore. H what we've done now is we've simplified it. And it's basically, it's just one HTML. You're just using HTML. It's not quite the same as tag soup because your browser will know that you're following standards. But it's similar in the sense that we're not going to keep trying to like specify exactly which version of HTML we're coding to. And then the browser will render it differently depending on if you actually forget, ooh, in HTML 4.01 transitional, you have to do this very specific thing. And in HTML 4.01 strict, you have to do this thing. And so now my entire page broke because I deviated a little bit. It's not going to do that anymore. This is, this is new in HTML5, and this is interesting. This is actually the HTML5 doc type, but no, it doesn't have a 5 there. It's because we're not doing versions anymore. It's just, this is just HTML from now on. It's a living standard. Always put this on the top of your page and know that it's simpler now than it has ever been.